Good afternoon, and uh, may I invite those who are joining our session? Take your seats. You are for a great 45 minutes right. My name is Kristalina Georgieva. I am the acting president of the World Bank, uh, and uh, I have the incredible privilege to moderate a conversation with two leaders who make their countries and their continent proud. Uh, President Paul Kagame, uh, president of uh, Rwanda, is also the leader of the African Union. And uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa is the uh, leader of South Africa, which is the one country in the continent that has a rightful place in the G20 format. So I am, uh, they don't need much introduction, but let me, let me share with you an observation of the two countries when we look at them from the site. At first glance, they appear very different in terms of size. Um, I was actually quite surprised that when I calculated that in territory, South Africa is 46 times bigger than Rwanda. But in population, it is only four times bigger. They have very different geographic location, one with a big coastal line, the other one landlocked. But there are also great similarities. Let me start with sports. Both nations are very ambitious, and they chase each other in cycling. <laughs> um, in nature, they are beautiful countries. And those who are lovers of nature tourism, they obviously would be honored to go to both countries. But what is, uh, to me, very impressive is that they both have very strong ambition in e-commerce. Both countries are among the top 10 ranking in B2B, business-to-business e-commerce. The similarity that actually anybody who visits uh, South Africa and Rwanda would carry is the aspiration of people and of the leadership of the country aspirations to be integrated in the regional and world economy, to provide high quality jobs, to have opportunities for young people. I was recently in Rwanda, and I came hugely impressed by how the young people of Rwanda aspire to solve social problems of their communities, of their countries. And it is exactly the same in South Africa. So these are the leaders that we have with us. And I would like to start first with jobs, regional integration, trade. Uh, and turn to President Kagame. You did what many thought was impossible integrate the region with a free trade agreement. How do you see this agreement providing opportunities for growth? What would it mean in five, ten years from now? How do you see it lightening up growth in Africa? Thank you, Christelina. And uh, you started on a very clear note about uh, African, African countries, uh, irrespective of uh, geographical differences and the possible other differences. Mm -hmm. There is uh, a lot more in common, uh, starting with the, the aspirations, mm -hmm. aspirations of uh, uh, one country on one end of the continent and uh, the other at another end uh, are the same. Mm. 
And, and this is what has made it possible for Africa, you've seen uh, in the last years, that Africa is talking more and more about integration, uh, working together uh, in all sorts of ways. In fact, that's also what has made it possible uh, to realize this continental free trade area. It, it has been building up to that point. Uh, Africans wanting to work together, to trade with each other, to uh, do all kinds of things in complementarity where everybody is a winner. Uh, in actual fact, again, there is a realization that Africa, very big continent uh, with uh, uh, 1.2 plus uh, billion people, mm. uh, 55 countries, but if you prefer to look at it country by country and staying like that, you realize that any of these individual countries, uh, even the countries that are actually big, significantly both economic, in economic terms and geographical terms, when you disaggregate that, you find each country is small. When you are thinking about the global events and the size of populations and other things globally. So coming together, integration makes the continent big and all of us gain, even small countries like mine uh, end up uh, being elevated to higher level than the actual size if you looked at it individually. So the continental free trade area has come into being uh, with that backdrop, and it is bound to benefit Africans. In a major way, there is no question, because if you look at uh, uh, by region, if, I mean, if you look at regional exports, mm -hmm. uh, being at 42 uh, percent, and the exports with the, the rest of the world outside of our continent being only at 15 percent, mm -hmm. yep. that already tells you the potential we have to gain through having a, a continental free trade area as countries uh, are now, uh, in fact, 18. We are at 18 now, countries ratified ready to go, and uh, we have many others mm. signing up and ratifying as we move. But at the first signing, the first day was 44 countries, which uh, showed the appetite mm. the countries had, again, based on the other aspirations I talked about, uh, to make sure that we gain, and we gain by Creating this space, we gain, again, there is more employment and jobs yep. uh, created, there is no doubt, and I gave you the volumes of uh, exports, uh, which again uh, will speak for themselves. So I, I think there is no question about CFTA benefiting Africa, benefiting every individual country that uh, is uh, involved. And it is a great legacy that you would leave behind. There is no question. I, I am sure, I actually think that um, uh, this is a uh, landmark uh, achievement for the African Union, and it deserves a round of applause from this <laughs> audience. <laughs> uh, and if I may uh, now turn to you, uh, President uh, Ramaphosa. You have an incredible resume. I read your biography and I thought, whoa, this is somebody who was student activist, trade unionist, freedom fighter, accomplished businessman, and a very effective politician. <laughs> so what do I ask somebody with that resume? And then I thought I would turn to you in your um, strong standing on your experience as a businessman. I, I, I learned that you have a foundation that focuses on education and small and medium-sized businesses. So my question to you is, from that perspective, 
What do you think the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement means for private sector? Mm -hmm. What can the private sector do to make it successful? And how can the small and medium-sized enterprises benefit? How do you see it? Well, thank you very much. I think uh, you are right in calling for an applause, mm. but the applause should also go to leaders like President Kagame, uh, who, as the chair of the African Union, really shepherded this whole process and made sure that it finally happens. And the president of Niger, who was also given the direct responsibility. Yes. And both of them really did an incredible amount of work to make sure that finally we have a free trade area agreement, mm -hmm. which has been built on the foundation of the political integration that was set up when the AOU, OAU was set up and now the African Union. Yeah. And that political integration is holding, it's firm, it's effective. And on that, we've now got this uh, free trade uh, area agreement. Now, what does it mean in terms of uh, the benefits it could yield? I mean, clearly, it opens up enormous opportunities for businesses on the African continent. The coming together of a market of 1.2 billion yes. people is a huge opportunity for any business person or any business, uh, small or large. Mm. It opens up great possibilities also for manufacturing because it is a trade agreement that is going to enhance and enable products and services to be traded throughout the continent. Hitherto, we've tended to trade with other countries outside the continent. So this is an enabler that's going to make us trade within the continent, with each other, but it will also help small, medium, and large companies to start off businesses where they manufacture goods that are in great demand on the continent. So I see it in the end leading to the creation of manufacturing nodes on the continent, industrialization mm -hmm. will start spreading throughout the continent. But the other thing it will also do is the creation of jobs. Uh, many jobs will be created as people begin to trade goods and services, and those companies that will take up the opportunities will, will want to create more and more products and sell them. The other important thing for me is that it is also going to lead to skills development. Mm -hmm. Skills will be spread, and we will also be able to benefit from best practice, so it will enhance competition amongst companies in various countries, but it will also lead to smart competition amongst nations as well, where they begin to develop specialization around producing certain products. Uh, various regions will also spring up and be able to specialize in certain areas. And so I, I think this is a great boon for the continent and if you like, it could well be the great uh, industrialization moment for the continent. And already, we've got a lot of business people in many countries who can't wait for the various governments on the continent to ratify uh, this free trade area agreement so that they, they can get going. And those who have not yet signed are going to be under enormous pressure themselves uh, from their various businesses, uh, as those yes. businesses will say, we're being left behind. Yes. So it's going to be a wonderful leveler, and it's also going to create all those great opportunities. That is uh, the future we want. And when we talk about the future of Africa, 
and the uh, potential of the uh, uh, continental uh, trade area. We also have to imagine it with digital being the connector of all countries in the 21st century. Uh, President Kagame uh, actually also did a huge service to the continent with Smart Africa. Um, and I am, we had the, that conversation that we cannot imagine um, growth in the 21st century without digital connectivity. We cannot imagine Africa being left out of the digital economy, but we can imagine Africa leapfrogging through it. And uh, so my, my but not, today we are not yet quite there. Today, uh, internet connectivity in Africa is only 22%. That is way lower than people want. I had a very interesting conversation with young Africans, and they're telling me that they see this as number one right, the right to connect to others via the internet. Uh, at the World Bank, we are imagining what we call digital moonshot, aiming for every African citizen, business, and government service to be connected to the internet no later than 2030. And actually, the same young Africans said to me, what do you mean 2030? 2030 is so far. We want it next year. We want it now. Uh, so my, my, my uh, question to President Kagame is, how do you see that being done fast? What needs to happen? And also, what do you demand from your partners? Partners like the African Development Bank, the Economic Commission for Africa, the African Union, the World Bank. Uh, the, the, give us marching orders, so off we go to the moon. Well, we, we will get to the moon. Uh, first, the Smart Africa effort was um, a result of uh, the awakening of uh, Africans across the whole continent, that the future mm -hmm. uh, is more or less all of it digitalized. And therefore, yeah. we need to uh, discuss among ourselves. We need to talk about uh, policies and uh, harmonize uh, different things we have to undertake for the whole continent to be digitalized. And I think it started, and it will always start with the change of mentality the mindset and the political will uh, that has to drive it. I think there is that realization across the continent, the political leaders of our continent, the, especially the young people you talked about, we have uh, across Africa under 30 years of age, uh, between 60 and 70 percent of the population. These young people are, are hungry, they are part of uh, uh, this process, hungry for what is it that can make a difference in, in their lives. It's not just about uh, uh, social media or being connected for the sake of it. There is also livelihood in yep. this connectivity. People are doing business uh, through connectivity. They are making profits. They are uh, trading on uh, e-commerce and the digital platforms that uh, facilitate that. So it's, it's really a very exciting moment in my view. And, and the politics uh, of governance of our continent has to align with this. Uh, there, there is no alternative because if the majority of the population are into this, they see it as an opportunity for a better future, they are just out there searching for the ways forward, it is just important and right for that 
political environment to, to be there. And then, so the, the marching orders, therefore, in which if, if, I, if I may take advantage of your request, mm -hmm. uh, is with the political correct political mindset, mm -hmm. we move into uh, the mobilization of investments in the area of infrastructure. Uh, mm -hmm. that would support that in uh, education uh, and training for development of the very skills and knowledge that are required for this digital economy to, to be built and thrive and deliver the promise that uh, it has that people have identified. I think this is what is needed and it implied in your statement of uh, moonshot, getting to that high ground where I want to be in terms of development. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I am very uh, uh, pleased to report to you that the broadband commission that you co-chair has agreed that it is absolutely paramount to have a working group on Africa. So from all possible directions, we will be working to make that a reality. And my question to, to President Ramaphosa is, what is on the way? What do you think are the obstacles to overcome? Um, I, I want to share with you something that, again, young, young African, uh, Africans were saying. One of the obstacles is that not all governments are comfortable to switch to e-government and to become part of this digital world. What do you think? Yes, I think uh, there are quite a number of obstacles. In fact, the earlier question that you asked, mm -hmm. where young people were saying, why should we wait to 2030? Mm -hmm. uh, they want it now. And in many ways, the young people have been ready. Yeah. A lot ready earlier than we can ever imagine. And in fact, you could say that we have been failing the young people of the African continent because we <laughs> much older and they blame us for that. And they say we move too slowly and we haven't opened up the broadband, the spectrum, and uh, they had expected us to have done so. And in a number of countries, data prices are just too expensive, like in my own country in South Africa, and they're putting pressure on government to say reduce the data prices because they, they live in the internet. They, they, they live in the technological world. So the, the barriers has been governments that have been moving too slowly mm. and that have not quickly and fully embraced this new, bright and brave world that young people live in yep. today. Yep. And so therefore, we, we've got to be ahead of the curve. We've got to embrace it. And you, you, you mentioned something uh, quite relevant. You know, governments have been also too slow to move to e-government. Yep. We talk about it all the time, but we don't do it. And uh, the pressure that we are now facing from, from young people and indeed from the exigencies of the now digital and technical world require that we should actually not only embrace, but we should leapfrog. If you look at the way mobile telephony took off in Africa, uh, and now smartphones, the way they've taken off, and the way a number of Africans are utilizing their mobile devices uh, to do business, to trade, and in a number of African countries where banking has also uh, been affected through mobile telephony, it just shows you that the African continent and its people have been ready long, long, long ago, and uh, we've been rather slow. And I think the call and the, the, the responsibility on governments is that pull out all stops. Mm -hmm. pull out all stops, and it should never take us a hundred years to set in place policies. 
we should uh, move quickly. And I'm rather glad that the African Union has now taken the bit in its mouth because uh, the next summit we are going to be dealing uh, with issues that have to do with the digital world and uh, we now need to be getting into you know, artificial intelligence in a very smart way, clever way, blockchain and, uh, and all these other technologies. And Africa now has this great opportunity, having lost out on the previous revolutions that we've had, to leapfrog. And indeed, the way mobile telephony has taken off on the African continent, it does show that we've got the skills, we've got the capability, and we should now have the courage uh, to be ahead of the curve and embrace technology in a, the fullest way. Our young people are already there and they are going to leave us behind even as government. Yes. So we need to yes. step up yes. ourselves. We do. Let me tell you a little anecdote in my own work at the World Bank. We hire young people, they come with new skills and then they tell me, you're making us learn how to work the old way with paper and meetings. <laughs> you see? So we have all have work to do, but to be just to ease our pain as being from the older generation, my uh, father used to say, age is a matter of mind. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the issue for us uh, is... Um, uh, to make the physical investments in uh, digital infrastructure, to place everything we can on digital platforms, from digital ID to education, to governance, to commerce. And uh, I just give you our pledge that we will do everything we can to accelerate this process. Uh, but I also want to bring another angle. Okay, we have all this. President Kagame said we need people with skills for the 21st century. Yeah. Uh, at the World Bank, we have been very uh, determined to make the focus on investing in people front and center in our discussions. Why? We did a calculation of the wealth of our planet. And we were surprised that two-thirds of this wealth is us, it is people. And the richer a country is, the higher of the share of human capital. Rich countries have 70% or more. The poorer a country is, the smaller is the share of human capital. So it is paramount that we concentrate on that. We created an index, human capital index, ranks countries, and provide some motivation. Uh, and my, what I would like us to talk a little bit about is uh, how can we make that human capital investment in a way that is corresponding to the needs of the, the 21st century? We very humbly uh, learned at the World Bank that just getting kids in school, not enough. Schooling, doesn't mean learning. Learning doesn't mean skills. And skills not necessarily lead to jobs. How to close this circle? What is your wisdom? What would you like to share with our audience on that? Well, thank you again. Uh, and if what you are saying is right. Things must uh, uh, be aligned and there has to be sufficient amount of planning put into it. Mm. And uh, one has to look at it in a holistic way, not just uh, uh, looking at it in a piecemeal and plugging here and there. And so, but all those things you said are very important, uh, whether it is learning, whether it is skills, whether it is on their own, mm. they are important. But you, they become more important and more productive and useful if you bring them together mm -hmm. and wrap them into something that 
has been planned for, and that means the aligning of these uh, uh, things we have said into something that gives a product, gives results towards, or solutions towards what you intended to do. What we have also been seeing over time is that there are uh, different results of different kinds of research have been coming up with all kinds of methods uh, of education, how to educate people, mm -hmm. how to, mm -hmm. you know, let people explore uh, with their minds freely uh, and put heart into it, rather than just, you know, performing or doing things like machines. So there are many things out there, research has been done, but it starts from the beginning. And, and here I have to mention and thank the World Bank group that has uh, not only generally looked at this in a big way in terms of uh, human capital development for, for everyone, but particularly for my country, we have benefited from uh, uh, co collaboration with the World Bank and of course a lot of investments being made in this area and in the index you mentioned uh, for legacy reasons, for historical reasons, in fact my country didn't perform as well as we would have liked. In fact this is why I'm saying the investment the World Bank is making with us is very timely and very useful because we've learned from all those legacy problems and, and, and mistakes, and we are now investing properly, uh, trying to fix the different problems, starting from the grassroots, because you don't expect to start educating a child when yeah. uh, they are five years old and on, on. The, you start from in fact, the, the, the effort starts when uh, the, the child, the baby is still yes. in the, the mother's womb. Yeah. How this child is, you know, mm. benefits from the well-fed mothers. It starts from there, when they are born, and that's what brings up the early childhood development, mm. uh, understanding that there are heavy investments to be made here, because if they lose out on this stage, mm. later on, uh, they may not actually catch up. They've lost some of the things forever. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the holistic approach we are talking about, right from the early childhood uh, yes. education programs and then mm -hmm. the primary school, secondary school, up to university, but in a more and a better fashion the manner to allow the modern times to uh, dictate some of the things that have to be looked at. And uh, do you find the ranking helpful that, that you're being ranked somewhere in yes, the index? Uh, yes, absolutely. The ranking is very helpful because uh, something that you measure, mm -hmm. the measurements of everything are going to uh, direct people which path to take. It's absolutely important. It is evidence-based and uh, it, it, you are able to not only measure and understand where you are at a particular point, but you're also going to be able to measure the progress you are making with the kind of uh, investments you have made. And I can tell you this is everywhere. I, am, uh, I have been talking in my own country about investing in education, but it was when I told them you are not ranked 44 when everybody started paying attention. Why 44? Why not higher? Uh, and actually, this is so because we want people to be productive. Uh, uh, President Ramaphosa, you have been uh, talking about uh, jobs as being your absolute priority. And actually, I quote you f that you're focused on the one thing your country needs most, jobs, jobs, and jobs. So how, how do you see that investing in people translating into jobs? So you, you don't end up with people who have skills, but the jobs are not, not there. 
No, precisely. Let, let me start off by just reflecting a little bit on the earlier issue about uh, how we spread uh, skills, particularly young people, uh, the digital skills and all that. This is a, a challenge, a global challenge, I would say, and possibly more in Africa. This whole challenge just got a very good shot in the arm mm. uh, with a, a report that has just been released by the International Labour Organization. Mm -hmm. I was privileged enough, together with the Prime Minister of Sweden, to lead a commission at the ILO, which has been looking at the future of work. Mm -hmm. And in a very practical way, the ILO, which is celebrating 100 years this year, uh, which is business and labor, uh, people got together, labor organizations around the world and business organizations, and started grappling with the challenge of how are we going to deal with the fact that the work process is changing and is being challenged by the, or put under pressure by the industrial the fourth industrial revolution, mm -hmm. climate change, uh, globalization and a whole range of things. And they've come up with a wonderful report which if you care, people should actually try and, and look at it on the internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, it focuses on how we can ensure that people get lifelong mm. skills development, lifelong learning, and uh, argues that there should be an acceptance of a universal life entitlement mm -hmm. to lifelong learning. Yeah. That from a very early age you should be learning and uh, it speaks to the issue of early childhood development. Yep. Additive. First thousand days of any child are the most important. Focus on that and let them get skills throughout their lives, early childhood, primary school, and even as they start work, they should be skilled. And beyond that, as work forms change, they should be reskilled. And beyond that, they should also be upskilled, where they learn new uh, skills so that they adapt to the challenges that are given rise to by the Fourth Industrial Revolution and all these other fundamental developments that are taking place. Now, what does that all mean? It means that when people are more skilled, they are then employable. They are then able to get into job situations a lot better. And that has been proven in a number of countries. So as we talk about jobs and jobs and jobs, mm -hmm. we should also be on a drive, not only to create jobs, but also to train people and make sure that they get skilled and where they are displaced either by robotics, machines, and artificial intelligence, we should give them what we would call a just transition. Mm -hmm. And people should not just be dumped. And that is why the ILO report revolves around a people-centered yeah. process that is going to enable people to, uh, as work changes, to be properly transitioned into other jobs and other forms of uh, uh, economic activity. Now, jobs clearly are, are a challenge uh, for many countries. In my own country, we've got uh, uh, almost nine million people yeah. unemployed, and many of them are young people. Mm -hmm. And we are devising a number of strategies to address this problem. Recently, we held a joint summit with labor, mm -hmm. business, government, and non-governmental organizations, and we came up with a number of interventions mm -hmm. which can be embarked upon to create jobs. And already the process of creating jobs is being addressed uh, by all these role players, and we think we're building a wonderful foundation for collaboration and cooperation amongst various role players. So in the end, mm. it should not only be seen to be the responsibility of government alone to create jobs. Mm -hmm. 
it's seen as a societal problem yep. and a challenge. The business community participates. Labor also sees that it has a responsibility to make sure that it does not only keep those who are their members who are in jobs, but it also expands the envelope mm. to ensure that even those who are not in employment also get jobs. Yep. So it then begins to deal with the labor market uh, issue and uh, we jointly address it and find solutions. So for us, it is great and I just want to end on how we, we're preparing even young people uh, for skills in the digital world. We're soon going to be embarking on a massive drive to ensure that we train our young people. We've got almost, I would say, about 14 million mm -hmm. young people in either primary schools as well as in colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. We want to spread the digital uh, mm -hmm. education through, uh, to all of them and even mm -hmm. ensure that on a progressive basis uh, we give them these devices that are going to enable them uh, to get better trained. This is an investment that we want to make for the future, mm -hmm. want to make for young people, because once they have that, then it becomes a lot easier for them to get jobs, mm -hmm. because they are better prepared, particularly for the fourth industrial revolution. So this is a commitment that we are making for the young people of our country. Well, I think this deserves a round of applause, that commitment to the young people. Um, I, I cannot agree more with you that this just transition is essential. In the European Union, over the last decade, they lost 15% old manual jobs, and they created 15% new economy jobs. It looks like everything is great. 15% gone, 15% new. The problem is the people who lost their jobs didn't have the skills to migrate into to migrate. new jobs. Yeah. And what we see in Europe is more populism, yes. more anxiety in society. So just transition. Um, we are running fast um, out of time. We have two and a half minutes left. <laughs> and I would have two questions to President Kagame. When you pass the baton to uh, President Al-Sisi, what are you going to tell him? And uh, to President Ramaphosa, when you go to the G20 in Japan, what message do you have on behalf of Africa mm -hmm. to your colleagues in the G20? President Kagame. Well, to my colleague and friend, uh, President Ari Sisi of Egypt, who will be coming to take over the chairmanship of the African Union, I, mm -hmm. I will almost uh, telling him the obvious that mm. the job carries uh, have a responsibility mm. of uh, thinking beyond our own particular countries, mm. but uh, the whole continent of Africa and how to uh, keep uh, the African continent united around these uh, very uh, important and positive and consequential uh, themes to do with the transformation. Uh, so I'll be telling him what he knows, but I'll be telling him also what uh, I have experienced, experience that it is also doable. Uh, it's a noble effort that he just continues until he gives the baton to another African leader to keep uh, carrying all of us and the continent forward. So it, it's, it's a more or less a pretty obvious message, but also giving him uh, the kind of uh, uh, balance sheet as we have it from the previous. Uh, and your phone number so he can call if he has <laughs> questions to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask him his phone number so that I can call him to uh, say I'm available. President Ramaphosa. No, the message that uh, you know, I, I will be taking to the, the G20 is a very strong call for strengthening the multilateral system in the world. 
because we in Africa, and South Africa sees itself as it participates in some of these forums, particularly the G20, we do it on behalf of the continent of Africa to, to be the voice of the African continent and developing economies in the world. And as we speak there, we want to be stressing uh, that a multilateral system needs to be strengthened, needs to be retained, and should not be weakened. Uh, we base it on our lived experience. Africa has, is making the progress that it is making today because we've decided that it is only when we work together, when we collaborate, and when we embrace multilateralism that we are able to move forward. Now, there are others who are trying to weaken and in a way also destroy the multilateral system. And we want to reiterate that we need to strengthen it, we need to strengthen the UN. And in strengthening the UN, we also want to carry a very strong message that the UN Security Council needs to be reformed because there is a huge chunk of people in the world who are not represented. Africa is not represented on the UN Security Council, and it cannot carry on like that. It is the most unfair and inequitable uh, type of um, um, cooperation. So cooperation means include everyone, let everyone have a voice. So we will also be arguing that the various other multilateral institutions in the world should also be strengthened and everyone should have room to participate in. And we hope that this is heeded because it is out of the strength of the multilateral system that we've been able to address many problems in the world. The world has prevented a world war because the UN, which is a multilateral organization, has held us together yep. and has prevented that from happening. And uh, we should be thankful for multilateral organizations or institutions and strengthen them on an ongoing basis. So that is the message I'll tell you for. Well, as somebody who represents an international organization here, I can tell you that I can give you my pledge and this of my colleagues that we will strive to be the very best to serve you, you. to be worth of your trust that you have expressed uh, in us. And we run out of time. Uh, exactly when we started warming up in a very good conversation, uh, unfortunately, I need to wrap it up now. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the audience, thank you. And say the following, as someone who has uh, so many times enjoyed the warmth and hospitality of Africans visiting Africa, and someone like many here who loves Africa, I am so grateful that Africa has leaders like you, so happy about it. And uh, I want to finish with what we all so much love about Mandela giving us this phrase, impossible until it is done. Yes. 21st century is the century of Africa Thank with you. leaders like you and the people of Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.